Okay, uh, the Honourable Member. Questions and comments? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I noted that uh, the Honourable Member talked about free trade. He also specifically mentioned our trade agreement with Mexico. Now, of course, that's NAFTA. That's a trade agreement with Mexico and the United States. Um, I'm wondering if the member has taken the time to actually read that agreement and read the side agreements. Because the very important side agreement to NAFTA requires Canada, as a signatory, to ensure it never downgrades its environmental standards for an economic advantage. And it takes measures to ensure that Canadians can participate in decision making, particularly in projects that may impact the environment. Now, this government, as the member knows, uh, took a move where they downgraded in the last budget bill all of our environmental laws. Secondly, the Minister of Natural Resources has said all these Canadians who want to participate in that pipeline review are un-Canadian. They're terrorists. What would you like to say about that? The Honourable Member for Mississauga Streetsville. Well, well, you know, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Natural Resources said nothing nothing of the thing. But uh, what we've done through our changes to the Economic Action Plan uh, is to say that we're going to have a streamlined, responsible, effective, one-time, proper, full environmental review, not duplicating processes, and actually relying, relying on our provincial partners who have a lot of expertise as well in environmental review. I call that working together with our partners. We've indicated that that any projects for pipelines or expansions or whatever will be approved solely on the basis, as the Prime Minister said, of it meeting the scientific requirements. That's the commitment. That's what we're going to do. But we have to be mindful as well. These projects are very important for a region like this member, like this member is from, Alberta. These projects are extremely important for the long-term economic viability and for long-term jobs, not just in Alberta, but across the country. Uh, question and comment, uh, Deputy. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Laurentie de la Belle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a question for my colleague opposite, uh, who seems to be a champion of free trade. I was in uh, Japan last May, and I met with a member of the Canada-Japan Chamber of Commerce who revealed to us that consular services had been completely closed at the Tokyo Embassy. This gentleman recruits 150 to 175 Japanese students who pay good money to come and study in Canadian universities. And this gentleman was told at the embassy that he could turn to our consular services in Manila or elsewhere, I forget where. So is this a serious way of fostering free trade with a country that is by closing consular services without any notice? That's my question, Mr. Speaker. Or Mississauga Streetsville. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we certainly encourage uh, companies that do uh, uh, work in, in, ver in different countries and, and want to ensure that workers can come back and forth as long as they meet proper criteria, as long as the labor market opinions uh, uh, are appropriate and work out to allow workers to from companies to come to Canada to work and vice versa for Canadians to work in other countries. With respect to specific consular services locations, what we have done is we've made the system more efficient. The fact of the matter is, is that you often don't need as many physical buildings. We live in an electronic world. Many of these applications are processed electronically, remotely. You could be virtually anywhere and get these, uh, get these documents processed uh, through uh, online services. So what we're doing is we're making sure we're providing value for taxpayers in Canada. We're making sure we continue to have our services abroad in countries around the world that both Canadians and Canadian businesses and others can get access to. And I think we're moving in a responsible, reasonable manner forward. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a member for Edmonton Strathcona, it's my pleasure to rise and speak to the motion tabled by my leader. I'll focus my particular remarks on the leader's call for this government, this federal government, to show leadership in bringing all of the governments of this country together at one table to reach consensus on the future of our country. And I'll also speak to his call for a shift 
towards a more balanced 21st century economy. Yes, as I would say to all of my constituents when I go door to door, Canadians do want a strong, stable, sustainable economy. But an economy for whom? That was usually a wake-up call for them. And they had a dilemma during the election. Oh, who do we vote for? Who would have thought? New Democrat or Conservative? They were concerned about the economy. But when I would simply say to them, well, who is that economy for? They would say, well, you're right. We're not convinced that the direction that this government is going is actually considering our interests. They're considering some people's interests, but not necessarily ours. As many in the House have said, we now have the highest household debt in history, 15% rate of unemployment for youth. In my writing, I have three universities. That's a lot of youth who need summer jobs so they can pay their university fees, struggling for jobs. A net loss of more than 300,000 jobs over the last few years. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I apologize at the outset. I should have said I will share my time, and I'm pleased I'll be sharing my time with the member from Dartmouth, Cole Harbour. Thank you for that reminder. As I mentioned, uh, an economy for whom? Well, we still have far too many First Nation communities in our country struggling just to have the basic amenities, amenities that other Canadians take for granted. And worst of all, a mounting environmental debt. That is a growing legacy. That is an economic cost that this government has chosen to download on future generations. Why would we call on the federal government to show leadership? Well, this country is a federation, and the Constitution clearly sets forth mandates for the federal government and mandates for the provincial and territorial governments. It clearly sets out shared powers for economic development, for environmental protection, and for our social system. It's therefore critical that the federal government show leadership in convening all of those orders of government. And frankly, that should also include our municipalities and our First Nations, something that this government is completely remiss in reaching out to. I've had the privilege over my career to sit at many consensus building tables where the federal and provincial government, industry, farmers, First Nations, and the public sit and discuss major critical issues, including standards for our energy industry, and reach consensus together, all hearing the same information, all receiving the same information, all hearing the voices together, not divide and conquer. That is what's divisive, meeting one by one behind closed doors. Not only should the Prime Minister accept the invitation of the Premiers to join their economic summit, he should instruct his ministers to start showing leadership for national action. In job creation, in particular for our youth and for our Aboriginal communities. He should encourage the ministers to show leadership in innovations in strengthening public health care. That is what Canadians are concerned about. Just look at the polls. I welcome you to come to Alberta. You want to see what the number one concern? the continuation of public health care. They ask, what is the federal government doing to protect our public health care? Where is the leadership on a clean energy future? Well, this government claims to have shown leadership. They have marred this country's reputation by not only downgrading environmental laws, contrary to international commitments, but also backtracked on international laws and agreements. And as I mentioned, Mr. Speaker, earlier, in a question to uh, one of the Conservative members. I had the privilege of working with the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. That's the entity under the side agreement to NAFTA. And Canada signed on and committed that they would balance economic development and environmental protection. There are myriad provisions in there that this government is not obeying as they downgrade, as they shred our environmental laws and shred our environmental review processes. Whatever happened to the U.S. Canada Clean Energy Dialogue. I remember a former Minister of Environment in this government, very proud of that agreement, and regularly stood in the House to talk about the discussions that he had with his counterparts in the United States. When my colleagues tried to go to the United States to continue that dialogue in clean energy, they were castigated. They were called un-Canadian. This is what trading partners normally do. They get together and they discuss issues in common, and that includes 
hopefully, the move by this country towards a cleaner energy future. I commend my colleagues for pursuing that dialogue. Whatever happened to our commitments under the North American Agreement on Environmental Cooperation? As I mentioned, under that agreement and under the uh, U.S. Canada Clean Energy Dialogue, there was a commitment by this government, by this Conservative government, to work with the United States to invest a clean, smart energy grid. Where is it? It is possible, and I say this as an Albertan, I say this as a proud Albertan and a proud Canadian. I'm a third generation Albertan. It is possible to exploit our natural resources and protect the environment. It's pretty simple, and yet this government just doesn't seem to get it. They think that only one is possible. It's fine to downgrade our environmental laws. It's fine to shred laws worked on over the last four decades. It's fine to deny First Nations and local communities the right to be heard at the tables where we're discussing these major projects. And yet, that's a complete violation of the commitments under the North American Agreement. And again, a violation of their commitment never to downgrade their environmental standards for an economic advantage. And yet we look at trade agreement after trade agreement that has come forward by this government, and it has seriously downgraded the environmental provisions that were in NAFTA. I am encouraged that the Premier of Alberta, to her credit, has joined the call for Canadian energy strategy. I am hopeful that she will soon expand what she is proposing in an energy strategy to include a dialogue with all Canadians, that we will bring First Nation uh, governments to the table, that we will bring local communities to the table, we will bring the provinces and the territories to the table, all at one table to move forward to develop a clean energy future for the country. Regrettably, under this government's leadership, the dialogue has been very narrowly focused and behind closed doors. I need only mention the scandal around Bruce Carson. We don't know what's happened since then, what has happened to the investment of those millions of dollars, supposedly, towards a clean energy strategy for Canadians. We're still waiting. So, I call on this government today to follow, to take heed of the call of my leader. Let's start that dialogue with Canadians on a clean energy future for Canadians. To their credit, the CEOs of most of Canada's energy corporations have taken leadership. They've called for a price on carbon for their own industries that will put us in that direction, that will force the investment into cleaner energy production. Why does this not, government not get it? To my dismay, Mr. Speaker, a few days in, ago in this House, one of the Conservative members actually castigated the CEO of Shell for daring to call for a price on carbon that would ensure that we develop the resources in Canada in a cleaner way. I thought they were the friends of the oil and gas sector. So to ensure genuine competitiveness, we have to put environment into our economic policy. Our trading partners are waiting for us to do that. Many of our trading partners are well ahead of us. Germany, for example, have majorly transformed themselves from uh, a major polluting nation to one of the cleanest nations in Europe and major exporters of clean energy, as have many of the Scandinavian countries. And as much as this government likes to say they want a trade deal with China, they castigate them for emitting carbon, China is investing billions in cleaner technology. So, I encourage this government, all parties in this House, should support a move to a cleaner energy strategy. Albertans are behind this. They support the idea of a dialogue. They want to be at the table. I encourage this, this government to stop the divisiveness, bring everybody to the table, and let's move forward towards the 21st century. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my Honourable Colleague for Edmonton Strathcona for, as always, putting forward such a clear, reasonable presentation from an Alberta perspective about why we need action on climate. I, earlier today, was unable to finish a question, so I'd like to finish it by asking her. I was cut off at the point I mentioned there'd been a Liberal climate plan. I was going to go on to say it was introduced quite late, uh, that there hadn't been action for a long time when there should have been. But given that that plan was cancelled by Mr. Harper, we've seen no workable plan since. What does the member for Edmonton Strathcona think would be in the best interest of Albertans and Canadians in getting a climate plan underway while we still have some time to act? 
Before, bef excuse me, before I go to the member from Edmonton Strathcona, if I could just remind all honourable members to not use the given names of others in the chamber. Uh, the uh, honourable member from Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the honourable member for her question. Um, I think that her question is very well intentioned, and I think that I understand the direction that she's going in. But I would differ in this regard. I think in this country we are long past plans to address climate change. We are long past plans to create a greener economy. What we need is clear legislation, clear fiscal incentives, clear measures to trigger the investment in moving in that direction. I clearly am a strong proponent in law and order for the environment, and I believe that measures can be taken by the federal government to move us in that direction. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. I wanted just to pick up on, on the importance of the First Minister's uh, meetings. And today we're talking about the economy, and just, justifiably so. Jobs are on the minds of, of many Canadians. And I, I want to go back uh, to a First Minister's uh, conference that had taken place where they were able to resolve another issue, which ultimately led to the health care accord uh, that we now have uh, today. And there's a great deal of concern in regards to that accord is going to be expiring uh, in 2014. And again, there's going to be a need for the First Ministers to be able to, to come together. And I think Canadians uh, as a whole, from coast to coast, want to see stronger leadership coming from the Government of Canada that's prepared to say that, look, we're committed uh, to, to ensuring that the funds are going to be in place. We're, we're committed to ensure that there's going to be some national health care uh, standards. And the way you best do that is through uh, First Minister uh, meetings. And much like the health care accord uh, a few years back being achieved, uh, these First Minister meetings play a critical role in terms of the best interests of Canadians. Would she not agree uh, that not only is it important for the, the Prime Minister to get together this fall, but also to look at having regular, ongoing uh, First Minister meetings with our Premier so we can deal with the social agenda of Canadians, which should be in the first and foremost importance of all of our minds. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, thank you. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for supporting our call, which was made some time ago, for the federal government to take leadership and actually bring together the provinces, the territories, and frankly, also the First Nation governments to discuss the next accord. But there's a second reason why we need the Prime Minister to be calling this meeting and participating. The federal government has a huge responsibility in deliver, delivery of health services, both the, the power to invest majorly and to transfer dollars to the provinces, territories, and First Nations, but also the direct responsibility for the health of First Nation communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Dartmouth, Cole Harbour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, and I'm pleased.